<laughs> can you introduce yourself for anyone that's new in Kukushin? Who are you? What you done? Hi, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm Darren Stringer, and um, I've done a couple of things in karate. Um, yeah, I mean, I started karate a, a long time ago, so I've had the fortunate um, case to have had a long career and achieve a few things. But um, yeah, I've been fortunate to enjoy Kyokushin and, and, and the environment that it gives around. Um, obviously, I do karate. I've done a little bit of judo in the past. Um, those are my two main martial arts, so yeah. What made you choose Kukushin? Why? And who was your instructor? So, I started Kukushin through probably my father, to be fair, because um, my mum and dad and uh, their best friends, they used to go and watch the British Open. Um, before I was kind of born. Um, and my dad's best mate, Peter, um, his boy did Kyokushin, um, to be fair. And I grew up in South London, so I was small in a rough area-ish. Um, and as a result, I don't really know why I wanted to do karate. I just always remember and wanting to do karate. It's probably Bruce Lee or something like that. Um, Fortunately, as I said, I, I grew up in South London, in, in Streatham, right on the cusp of, uh, of Brixton. And um, through my dad's friend, we knew about Kyokushin. Um, I say we, my dad knew about Kyokushin. So um, we went to Crystal Palace to uh, start. I think I was uh, eight years old when I started. And um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different world when we started karate back then because um, there was like a waiting list and set times that you had to join the classes. Nowadays, it's just a case of you just walk in, you just start the class and everybody's happy that you're there, to be fair. But back then it was like hundreds of people in, in, in Crystal Palace and we were in like the main arena or the bowling hall. And then in the latter stages, we started going in gym free because, you know, the numbers dwindled slightly. But um, so I, I, I started at Crystal Palace when I was eight. Um, I was really fortunate to start under uh, well, it was she and Steve Arneal then, but uh, had she Steve Arneal in the later years. And um, him and Sensei Joe Borg were my first instructors down at Crystal Palace. Uh, Joe Borg left a um, couple of years after I started. I hope it weren't because of me, but... <laughs> and then uh, she and Felix Tomaza took over. So um, Han she was always there on a Friday. Um, and I've been very fortunate to be with him for literally my whole entire career in karate and Felix was the, the instructor that was taking the Tuesdays or, or Sensei Joe Borg um, to start off with. Yeah, I was really lucky um, to have started at a, a good dojo. Um, it's very easy for people to just pick up karate and just, you don't know no better. Um, you know, people pick karate normally because it's the first one that's the closest to them or, you know, little Johnny at school is doing it, so why don't you pick this one? But like I said, my dad, um, He'd known about it, he'd gone and seen the British Open in, in kind of the 80s and, and that lot. So I was really lucky to get into this one. It's, it's hard work, but you know, it's, it's well worth it, for sure. You have a infamous reputation for being one of the best, if not the best technician in Kukushin history. Can you elaborate on how you got there, why you got there, and the teachings of the late, great Steve Arnill what did he give you for you to be as good as you are? Um, I think how good you are is a perception of other people, I suppose. Um, I'm, I'm decent, don't get me wrong. Some people might say I'm, I'm really good. Some people might say I'm average. You know, it's, it's all about a perception on people. Hopefully I entertain people, I excite people, and I did well. So that's first and foremost. <laughs> it's not for me to decide certainly who the best is or if it's me or not. Uh, so we're here, there, one, two, three. Five, six, four. Okay. Drive that Gyaku in. I didn't there. <laughs> Drive it in and in again. As Wesley mentioned earlier, we're using this rotation to come back on a straight line. Hopefully he's gone one, two. Very flat to bring the straight back kick in. Okay, one more time. Then one, two, three, four, five, six. In. Yeah? Um, but yeah, I, I, I always prided myself on being an all-round karateka. Um, pr 
probably almost definitely because of Hanchi. He always um, was really strict on you know making sure that you was focusing on every every element, whether it was basics, whether it was Kata, Klika, Wuko, um, back when we all started. I'm saying we all started because all of us are kind of in the 40s and plus in the room. Um, so yeah, we we uh, we did all elements of karate, to be fair, under Hanchi. Um, didn't do too much pad work and too much sparring, but uh, that always came uh, through all the other little bits that he taught. Um, I was really lucky because he was um, obviously a, a great instructor. He gave um, a great depth on on his training methods and expressed um, a real um, a real thoroughness around technical ability. Probably because he was never the biggest himself. Um, we're both kind of little people. I'm five six with my heels on, uh, and she's probably a little bit smaller than that, maybe five five, but. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as a result, he, he always drilled in technique, 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 and uh, he wanted um, me to be able to compete in, in everything, not just, um, I don't want to say a one-trick pony, because it's hard to be a one-trick pony anyway in, in a full-contact sport. <laughs> you ready? But um, it, it, I enjoyed trying to be good at all elements as well, which is, is not easy, as, as a few people know, you know, having to multitask in training and things like that. People were always really surprised to say, um, you know, do I go to normal dojo lessons? Yeah, of course I go to normal dojo lessons because my instructor's there, for, first of all. Um, I enjoy basic karate, so why not? And then as a result, it, it served me well because I was pretty technical in, in, in the way I fought, the way I delivered techniques. Um, and that technique enabled me to produce more power because it certainly wasn't for my size. Um, in, in, in retrospect, when you look back on it, you think uh, someone this small doesn't have kind of the right to have this much power or be able to knock down people that are maybe six inches, X amount of stone heavier than him. But um, technique's very important on that. And I, I think a few people in this room share that philosophy, um, which has fortunately been given to us from our instructors. I'm gonna pick up on a point that you said that I didn't understand until now. But Hanji and you being of similar stature, was that a very good connection? Because when a man's done a hundred man kumite at that size, anything's achievable. Hmm. So because of your technical ability, I know that he took you to the world championships when you were young, or the junior world championships. Could you elaborate on your first youth tournament abroad, please? Yeah, it wasn't a world tournament, no. It was um, it was a Canadian Open, um, obviously in Canada. <laughs> uh, like a fair few months before, he was like, "Look, I'm going over here to teach and and, and be at this tournament. Um, do you kind of want to give it a go?" And I was the first kid, really, to do cadets um, in the organisation. So I was like, "Yeah, of course," because boys, especially, you get to a certain kind of age and you want to start kind of hitting the pad. You kind of want to start um, testing your abilities, I suppose, in, in, in ways that weren't so able to do so back in them days because up until 18 you were literally doing non-contact or, or, or the very, very best semi-contact in karate. So um, we were all training in the dojo, doing knockdown stuff, doing kind of uh, bag work, uh, sparring. So you kind of got used to it, but you, you didn't have that that kind of edge in, in tournaments. and. It's a completely different environment, as many people will know that when you compete versus when you do stuff in the dojo, it can be very kind of relaxed, jovial in the in the dojo. Um, even if it's really hard sparring, you know there's kind of a 
there's a line that most people won't step over. Um, but on the mat, <laughs> you take your eye off the ball for a minute, it's, consequences can be high. So anyway, I was like, yeah, why not? Let's, let's do this. I was 17 years old. Um, it was the kind of the first opportunity I got to travel abroad through karate as well. Um, up until that point, everything had kind of been national status, um, unless you count Wales as international, but I don't think you do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I started training as everybody does for their kind of first tournament. You have absolutely no idea on on what your status is, what your capabilities are, what is training enough, whether you're kind of doing the right things. But I was fortunate, you know, I, I, I trained a lot. I, I did, um, I was reasonably fit through throughout most of my career. <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, I went over there and gave it a bash. Um, when I got over there, um, she and Daniel Gauthier was the, um, he was the head of the Canadian lot over there and um, he looked after us and everybody was looking at me and I was tiny. I was like much smaller than I am now in, in terms of weight, maybe not height. But I think I, I think I weighed in at like 123 pounds. They weighed in pounds, I really don't know what that is in kilos, but it was light and then everybody's looking at me going, are you sure he's fighting? And then Hans was like, yeah, 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 he's fighting. He's, be okay. I mean, he's, he's, he's pretty good. Um, so everyone was like, I don't know, you know, he's he's small. <laughs> um, so in the lead up, we was there for around about a week. Um, I think we were there for maybe five days before the tournament, a few days after the tournament, and then literally every day, um, because it's Hanshi, um, he was teaching in, in several different dojos. Um, there were quite a few dojos. We were in Quebec, in uh, Montreal. And um, as a result, I was training like maybe two or three times a day, which is probably not usual a few days before a tournament. But um, started going around a few um, few dojos, and then obviously Hanchi's like, yeah, do this, do that, do this. And then everybody's like, yeah, okay, he's, he's pretty decent. Um, and I was only there originally to fight knockdown. Um, but then it turned out that there was a tournament uh, in Qatar on the same day. So then, uh, then the guy was like, uh, Shane Daniel was like, um, you know, do you want to, Kind of do the cat as well we've seen you do a lot of basics in in the sessions and some cat so you know you're quite welcome to do that i kind of looked at her and she went well what do you think and he went well you know you're here to fight totally understand that if, if, if that's all you want to do he said but you know you're here so if you want to give it a go on both then why not i was like yeah go on then uh, you know, why not in for a penny and for a pound type thing so um yeah i entered in both um and uh, I didn't, didn't do too badly. I, I won the cat and uh, came second in the knockdown. Um, so that's pretty good. Actually, it was um, like a year or the year of the first um, cat World Tournament and everybody was like, oh yeah, so we'll, we'll see you at the World Tournament, right? And it was later on in the year, I was like, no. And they were like, what do you mean no? I was like, well, I, I didn't get picked. And I got a really, really good mark in, in the Qatar. Um, and I was only coming in fourth place, I think, in the Qatar tournament at that point in time. Like I said, I was 17. I didn't. I don't think I won, I won it in the first time in 2003, which was the following world tournament. So I came fourth, third, second, and then first in, in the British Qatar tournament. But I just went over there and won the Canadian Open effectively. And they were all like, well, maybe if you're not good enough to get in the team, we got a problem against the British then. So, uh, and as it so happened, uh, Sonny Taylor and uh, Chris Davis, they were in the individuals and they did really well in the tournament. So, you know, the choice was right at that point, but then four years later, I was able to compete in that. So, yeah, I mean, long story short, you know, I had a really good relationship with, uh, with Anchi and the similar size and stature and, um, I always wanted to do a hundred man myself as well, but never materialised in 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 that fashion. Never say never, I suppose. <laughs> you know, Darren Chan's got a little bit of life in him. Maybe I've got a little bit of life as well. <laughs> maybe not too sure, but maybe. You are the most successful cutter champion in Kukushin history. Can you tell me why, and what is it about cutter that inspired you to that greatness? Yeah, I think that goes back to the loop around in Hanshi, you know, um, he's really, really dedicated to, to Qatar. First of all, he loved karate in general, and I, I think I, I don't profess to be the same as him, but I really enjoy karate as a, to a totality. Um, I, I enjoy the people, I enjoy the process, I enjoy the 
art of trying to perfect something that is probably never going to be <laughs> perfected. Um, but you try really hard to get there. Um, you, you, you train a lot to be able to do things that, dare I say it, normal people can't. Um, I think karate is a very special breed of people. Um, they're able to push their body, their, their ideology about you know what's capable and what's not um, to another level. And I think that's probably the case with all um, full contact sports, um, but especially within karate because there's so many various disciplines. Um, yeah, I was really successful in karate. I, was, I think I'm probably, sounds a little bit strange saying it, but I'm probably the only person to have won the world tournaments in knockdown and, and kata, because like I said earlier, most people, they, they tend to specialize in a, in a, in a single area. Um, whereas I kind of wanted to specialize in all of them, but you know, <laughs> maybe that was good. Maybe that was bad. I don't know, but I, I enjoyed, um, what kata gave me in, in, multiple ways and I always relate um, when I teach um, what is your end goal my end goal was to be the world champion obviously like probably everybody's is and it doesn't come true for everybody but fortunately it did for me um, and I used all elements of karate to make that goal a reality um, yeah I did much better probably in in, in cat tournaments um, than I did in knockdown tournaments. I, I did pretty well in both, to be fair. But as a result, Kata gave me a platform to develop well in, in knockdown as well, because when you think about what you do in Kata, it's, it's dynamic, it's explosive. Um, you have a lot of footwork elements that exist within Kata as well. So you can transform them from basic elements in karate through to a more efficient process in, in fighting. And um, I always looked at every element of training as a platform to kind of make me better. Um, hopefully that worked, but. As a multiple world champion in all the styles, including knockdown, I think you're being very modest on your non-contact career as well, because <laughs> you're also a clicker champion. I would like to, or like you to expand upon your experiences of your first trip to Japan. Yeah, so I, I went to Japan in, uh, ironically, in, uh, in 2003, which was literally a few weeks after I won the first World Cat Tournament, uh, my, my first World Cat Tournament, not the first World Cat Tournament. So um, in 2003, I, um, I won uh, in Poland, and then probably about a month later or something, less than a month later, I went to Japan in, in 03, and I went to watch the, uh, the IKO One World Tournament. I've always wanted to go to Japan. I, I think it's the ideology and the, the ethos and the kind of the, the the process that every every person that does Kyokushin in particular that it comes from Japan. It stems from Japan. You want to go to Japan. Um, I was really lucky um, to have gone to Japan a, a fair few times, um, but the first time I went was to actually watch the tournament, and because it was IKO one, um, non IKO one people weren't allowed to fight in it. I actually applied for the next tournament in IKO one, ironically, in 2000, 2007, when I went again to watch. Um, but I didn't even hear back, so <laughs> uh, it, would, it, would, it would have been really nice because it's probably the biggest tournament in, uh, definitely in the world at that point. But um, definitely, I, I would say it's the biggest tournament in Japan at a certain period of time. Um, but it's really enjoyable, you know. the, the it's, it's, it's mental because you're kind of walking down the streets and you see like Kyokushin stuff all over the place. Ev everybody knows about Kyokushin in Japan. So it's like fantastic. And take karate aside, um, Japan's actually a, a really nice place to go. It's, um, you know, the people are friendly, the people are nice, it's kind of clean. There's a lot of, lot, a lot of people in Tokyo. So there's kind of that, that kind of cosmopolitan buzz around it um yeah and i just had a great time you know i stayed in a, a little youth hostel uh, yoyogi which was one of the olympic villages i think way back when but yeah, it was really enjoyable and uh, i've been to japan crikey uh, maybe five or six times in total now i think um which is quite nice and i'd go back again tomorrow if i could <laughs> Here's probably going to be the toughest question I can ask you. 
out of your numerous world championships and medals and tournaments that you've won, what would you consider your best achievement? Why? Or what would you consider yeah. your best tournament and why? Hmm. Um, I get asked this a lot and, and the answer is always the same, to be fair. What is my most prized tournament, I guess, is the, the version I, I give. Um, maybe not the best, uh, maybe not you know the best result, but my most prized tournament is a uh, 2005 World Tournament. Um, and that's because literally a few weeks before my dad died. So um, it was a very hard tournament in, in the sense of it was the first one I'd fought in without him being there. Um, he used to follow me around the world as both my parents did to be fair. Um, they've been to numerous places to watch me fight, but this was kind of the first one. And it was, a, it was, it was at my first dojo as well down at Crystal Palace. So it was, uh, it was a bit of an emotional roller coaster ride, to be fair. Um, training was going absolutely superb be beforehand, and then um, yeah, my the the tournament was on the eighth of October, and my dad died on the eleventh of September. So, kind of had a, a rough couple of weeks in terms of um, kind of having to put that behind me in in essence to kind of reevaluate and kind of get back into training mode for a couple of weeks for the World Tournament. Um, I came third in that tournament and um, it's the only trophy that is actually, I suppose, in my house. The rest are in the loft um, because of the sentimental value that it kind of means as a result. Would you say your mental toughness, as you just displayed, is one of the main assets of who you are as a person? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> people are probably going to really laugh when they uh, and they're going to agree. The people that know me, I'm quite stubborn. <laughs> I'm really quite stubborn. Um, it's a good thing and it's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad thing in some ways. <laughs> but, but I think mentally it makes me um, makes me tough um, in in many ways. I've had a really good work ethic my entire life um, to kind of overcome certain height issues I suppose I face <laughs> um, but uh, yeah I, I, I always push myself mentally to kind of the brink um, I, I make myself do ridiculous things in training that are mentally draining as well as physically and I think without those kind of elements it would have been really difficult to kind of compete in that tournament I'm by no means the only person that has a, a great mental attitude. You know, there's been a, a, a many amount of fighters. I heard um, that Mick Thompson lost his brother, I think it was, maybe two or three days before the British Open. And um, he, he went on and fought in the British Open. And I think it was the only time he, bought, he fought and beat Michelle Waddell um, in the British Open. So, you know, I think... Kyokushin karate in, in particular gives you a great mental strength because of the kind of the no die attitude I think is, is, is kind of instilled into the training methods. You know, we do thousands of techniques one after the other to, you know, show no kind of pain or kind of tiredness. Um, and I think that that is a great element to have. Um, Maybe not to the, the 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 stubbornness that I have in me naturally, but uh, <laughs> it definitely helped. Three on the right side, power. Five. What would you say to younger Darren or to any aspiring young Kukushin? What advice would you give your younger self? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's probably multiple answers that I could I could I could give myself. Um, I'd probably like to travel a little bit more um, and see a little bit more of the the kind of karate world. I was um, not not pigeonholed um, because it was a choice. I I, I definitely um, utilised my environment um, that I was in uh, with with you know a, a good dojo. I had a really good instructor, um, but. I could have followed him around the world, to be fair, and gone and trained at various different cam uh, camps and things like that, and I, I didn't. So I, I probably would have um, tried to explore that a little bit more if, um, if, 
if I had the money and, and well, I would have made ends meet somehow. But um, I think also, um, I think um, I probably would have tried to have knocked people out a little bit quicker <laughs> than, than what I than what I either ended up doing uh, maybe a couple of times later on in my life, but definitely earlier on in, in, in my career. Um, I just enjoyed hitting people and, and, and being hit at the same time, to be fair. Um, some people might say it's little man syndrome and maybe it is. I, I can't comment because I've never been big, so <laughs> I, can't, I can't comment on that. But um, yeah, I, I just enjoyed, um, enjoyed having a scrap on, on, on the mat, so to speak, technically, of course, but um, I enjoyed the process of um, hit and being hit. Um, Whereas maybe I would have done a bit better in a few tournaments. Uh, definitely earlier on in my in my career, had I have um, utilised uh, my flexibility a little bit more, shall we say? You are renowned for your training <coughs> efforts and not being injured. Could you give advice, or what advice would you give to people at training, or could you advise us on how you trained without getting injuries? Yeah, I've been really fortunate, to be fair, to uh, touch wood, not, not have um, really any injuries. Um, and I think, I think it goes down to me um, cross-training across all, all, all elements of cry, to be fair, because, you know, basic stances sh stretched my muscle fibres out longer. Um, so they were able to kind of maintain a, a flexibility level that maybe when you train in, in fighting and compact elements, um, a lot of people tend to get injured because, you know, they might try and stretch a, a little bit beyond their normal body shape um, is able. I, I'm first and foremost pretty flexible, especially for a male. So um, I worked on trying to be flexible and I am naturally flexible from a young age um, so I think that really helped me um, I always focused on uh, the purest technique that I could so I, I was never looking at kind of overextending an elbow or you know being in the the wrong position for my for my body and I was very conscious on on, on technically being kind of there if you know what I mean because I think some people, or sometimes people just throw a technique because they can, because they are young, because they are fit, because they are fairly capable, but don't necessarily think about the, the body mechanics that go through that process to deliver a technique. Um, most people are thinking, well, it feels like it hits pretty hard, so it must be fairly decent, and that might be a, a blasé comment there, but um, yeah, I've always, um, I've always kind of trained really, really hard, um, first and foremost, and had very little injuries um, as a result. Um, I've been fortunate to train most of my adult life on, on tatami mats as well, so I have no idea whether that is a, a play on, on the lack of injuries um, because of the, the, the soft, spongy um, floor. But then people that train on hardwood, they always tell me, oh, well, I always get injured loads when I train on mats. So, uh, I guess um, it's that. Your infamous dedication to the basics has let a lot of people want to follow your methods and you opened up an online training session. Can you tell me what it is, what it's about, how it got started and what it means to you? Yeah, so um, me and my friend Wesley Janssen, um, we started up uh, KRT Tips and Tricks. Um, and actually we, we had had the discussion before COVID actually hit um, to do this because we were going to release little tips and tricks, videos uh, for karate, um, the way we train, the things we do, because Wesley is, is very technically astute as well. And as, as myself, we focused on all areas of karate. And uh, basically we were gonna release little five minute snippet videos of training methods, and then people could kind of expand that up to, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half, however multiple times they wanted to do the, the, the exercises to kind of, improve their technical ability and kind of get some ideas on, on some exercises that could help with certain techniques, for example. So we had actually come up with the idea before COVID hit and then as a result, COVID hit and, and literally nobody was training anywhere. 
you couldn't go out of your house at one point. And it was it was mental. So um, probably for my own sanity and selfishness as well, it was probably created a little bit from there. But um, no, we, we we turned around and we were starting to do some some online sessions for our dojos and then we was like look well why don't we kind of join this together and kind of train at the same time we can do it under the krt banner you know and because uh, wesley's dojo is obviously hokori mayo mine is Pudo kukshin so we couldn't really call it either of one of them and the krt tips and tricks kind of fitted in quite nicely with that um, and then the main reason we started was to basically give people some light at the end of the tunnel in in a crappy situation that we were all in that was COVID. Couldn't see your family, you couldn't, you couldn't go out to the shops, you couldn't do this, you couldn't do that. And most of all, most people couldn't train. So we didn't want to lose, obviously, the great family that Kyokushin is. So we created this online training portal that, that enabled everybody to join in with us. And we actually had God knows how many world champions and European champions join us on a, on a Saturday uh, to join in with the sessions as well. So it also gave everybody the opportunity that they probably wouldn't have normally to train with all these great champions and see kind of their tips and tricks, so to think, in, in, in an online training portal. Um, and that was the main reason to basically give back, you know, myself, yourself, um, many people, Wesley as well, you know, we've gotten a lot out of karate um, from our instructors from people that have assisted us and helped us and kind of encouraged us and kind of supported us so it was definitely a time where we was able to give back relatively easily um, because we like training we, lo we, we love doing what we do and um, we really enjoy teaching together as well so um, it was kind of a perfect catalyst really to get that going and um, we were able to have 40 plus countries joining in on our sessions, hundreds of people joining in on a week by week basis. And we came up with kind of little jovial names uh, for each each training session. So it was like Marvelous Monday and Technical Tuesday and Thunder Thursday and Fabulous Friday and Super Saturday and all those kind of play on words. And in, in some ways it was to kind of keep people's spirits a little bit high as well. And, you know, you see this little email come through with <laughs> Marvelous Monday on it and everyone's like, well, well, you know, it's not so bad. I've got training tonight. And uh, it kind of, it worked really well. Um, you know, we, we were able to give to a, a, a lot of people. We were able to use our kind of familiarity with a lot of people through fighting in multiple tournaments in every region of the world almost um, to be able to kind of say hey we're, we're kind of doing this thing um, would you come and help us out and uh, teach for us or teach with us on like Saturdays so we had you know it's too many names to mention and if I mention one name it's probably going to upset a load of other names but we had so many high caliber of people um, teaching on, on, on those sessions with us and that can only benefit everybody else you know we did, not to say that we didn't get anything out of it but we didn't really do it for a personal gain we did it to kind of keep people engaged so that when the whole world kind of ended with its COVID stage that everybody was like, well, okay, I can actually just step back into the dojo because, you know, they could have quite easily have stopped. They could have quite easily have gone somewhere else um, and, and, and gathered a new interest or they could have just been really happy with all the money they saved in COVID and sat on their armchairs for the rest of their life. <laughs> but um, it, it, they didn't and they, they did support us and we did support them back. And um, as a result, um, we still teach today, to be fair, online, albeit once a week, because everybody has, rightly so, gone back to their dojos. Um, and we're very happy that we could have played a, a small part in, in the process to facilitate that and, and keeping people engaged. When you're not teaching your fantastic basics online, where can I find you? How can I learn from you? So I'm not too far from where we are right now in, uh, in Purley. I, I teach in South Croydon. Um, I don't live there, but I teach, I teach there. <laughs> and everybody's really surprised when they say, well, you, you don't live here. I'm like, no, I, I live I'm 40 minutes away or so. Um, I teach uh, at my dojo called Budo Kyokushinkai, um, which is in South Croydon um, uh, in, in Melville Avenue. If you 
want to find me, I'm on social media, either me personally or, or my dojo or through KRT Tips and Tricks if you want to join in on the online course as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I teach multiple times a week. Um, I'm also heavily involved with the, the organisation that I'm with, running courses, etc. Teaching abroad as well, so I'm, I'm around quite a few places. Um, and all you need to do is get in touch and we will gladly welcome you to the dojo anytime. What would you say is the most rewarding thing you have got from Kukushin? I think um, someone else has already said this, but it is a family feel. You know, I've got a lot of really close friends through karate, a lot of really close friends. I mean, um, for example, I don't really have any um, any school friends that I, I kind of stay in touch with now. And that's mainly to do with karate as well, because I was so focused on karate, I wasn't going out kind of clubbing all the time. I did go out, obviously, with my friends, but I kind of put things on a, on, on, on a back burner to focus on karate all the time. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to, you know, dedicate a, a lifestyle to karate and... Um, Selfishly, I've done that for probably 33 years, I think now I've been training. Started when I was eight, so yeah, I just turned 41, so 33 years. Um, but I've met a lot of really good people through karate with a, a kind of a similar mindset, a similar ethos. Um, we enjoy doing karate, training karate. We enjoy having a laugh and, and, and messing around with, with said people as well. So. I think um, if you're looking for people to kind of be around, in, enjoy training hard or, you know, getting a bit fitter, meeting like-minded people, I'd say karate is definitely the place for you because um, although it's not really a team sport, you don't go around kicking a ball around as, as 11 team, but you go to the dojo and you kind of have a, a really good environment, um, at least, I'd like to think at my dojo we do, and I know it happens in many other dojos as well, that you can just kind of enjoy yourself. You know, you forget about the crap day that you had. For example, when I was talking about the incident that happened in 2005 when my, when my dad passed away, um, karate was a, a, a great saviour for me in, in that way because as much pain as I was going through at the time, mentally outside of that, I was able to just go to the dojo and train with you know various people and for that hour and a half two and a half maybe three hours if you trained with me you <laughs> um, was only really focused on kind of doing the best you can and, and, and not collapsing to be fair um, so it's a it's a it's, it's a great place to be and I, I genuinely I know I'm a bit biased but I'd say that I'd very surprised that more people don't get involved in it because it's it's so diverse. It's so um, so multiple channels that you can kind of go down, and it will help out a lot of other areas of your life. Whether it's whether it's work, whether it's your your attention to kind of focusing on something, whether it's to kind of meet people, get fitter, yada yada yada. You name it. Kind of karate's kind of got it. Um, plus a few bruises on top, and you know that's <laughs> it's always fun, right? With your multiple achievements, two questions. One, is there another tournament within you? Two, what do you want to achieve in the next 10 years? Um, I think another tournament, I don't think I'd say never say never. Um, I'm in really quite good shape, um, as I mentioned earlier, no, no major injuries. <laughs> Maybe that would change if I was to do another tournament. But um, no, I mean, I, 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 I think once you're kind of bug bitten by by full contact um or, or or karate sports i think it is always in you to want to do another one whether that happens or not i don't know um i don't, I don't know um i'd like to think yes but who knows time and life takes over and you just you can't odds what's going on um sometimes in the rest of your life in the next ten years, I'd like to uh, I'd like to grow um, in 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 many ways. <laughs> Maybe a couple of more inches height as well. It'd be good, but I'd like to grow the, the the dojo. I have a fantastic dojo at the moment. Don't get me wrong, 
but the more people we get, the more people that we can share this beautiful sport that we do, um, sport and martial art, because it, it fits in both boxes. Um, I'd like to grow the organization um, and I'd like to grow the, the profile of Kyokushin in general, because there are a lot of organizations out there, um, but ultimately we all came from one place. And obviously this is one Kyokushin, so that kind of fits very, very nicely in, in, in that ethos because I think that there's a lot of people out there that do Kyokushin, there's a lot of people that know about Kyokushin, but there's also 7 billion, 8 billion people on the planet and maybe 7 billion of them don't, and I think they should, um, because I think what one Kyokushin does is, is beautiful. Um, I think what every Kyokushin organization, by and large, does is, is a great thing. Um, and I would like to see a lot more people enjoying what we have been lucky enough to enjoy. As a content creator yourself with KRT, how do you think One Kukushin has changed the platform? <laughs> yeah, um, One Kukushin changed the platform because it's, it's, it's literally like everywhere. It's, it's, it's as global as you can get, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I had like 40 countries joining in on, on KRT Tips and Tricks with me and Wesley. We had hundreds and hundreds of people coming to train with us every single week, week in, week out, over a two year period or whatever. Um, so we've got a pretty good, I don't want to use the, the word fan base, but I guess a, a, a social media reach. Um, I think what Wan Kyokushin and Sammy do in, in, in particular is they don't have any bias, any prejudice against anybody or anything. They kind of share loads of things going on. And as a result, and rightly so, it's reached over, I don't know, 200,000 followers or, or near to 200,000 followers. Um, and with, with that kind of content going out regularly, people get to kind of see great, great martial artists, uh, great content, uh, a very, very diverse concept as well, because you know, KRT tips and tricks, for example, we're, we're only sharing me and Wesley. Um, <laughs> and people might get bored of that or they might not, but um, with one kick shin, it's, there's so much going through that on like an hourly, daily basis. And um, I think what Sammy did for for the world of kick shin is, is fantastic. Um, I know he probably is a little bit embarrassed and a little bit shy about to take credit for, for, for what he's achieved, but you know, let's, let's not, beat about the bush too much. He he did create it, he did he did do the work and he put in the efforts and he you know he worked with a lot of people to create that content that, that keeps going out there and keeps inspiring people to to maybe keep going to the dojo, to, to keep on training on those those cold, wet nights um, that exist out there. And I think that's um, that's fantastic. So it's not just me and the one that's going out in the cold and the rain and stuff like that, but everybody can can look back on one Kyokushin and see maybe one day you're there, maybe one day you're not, but it's a great platform. There are rumours uh, you may be coaching abroad with another Darren from Kyokushin. Can I ask you, how did you get involved? What's it about? What are you doing? Yeah, uh, the, the double Ds, uh, Darren and Darren. Uh, it's, it's always a confusing time when we're together because everyone's like, Darren, we're like, yeah, 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 which one are you talking about? Um, so normally it's Chan and Stringer to, to make it easier. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've known Darren Chan for over 20 years, um, easily. Um, I think we met probably around about 2000, 2001. Um, we actually fought in our first uh, world tournament in Valencia together 20 years ago this year, uh, 2002. So um, we've had some ups, we've had some downs, we've had some good times, we've had some arguments, but ultimately we've, um, we've always been really close. Um, we've trained a lot together, we've fought a few times against each other, competed against each other as well. Um, it's always enjoyable to be around him. Um, and uh, as a result, we got talking uh, probably earlier on this year again, quite a lot, I think it was, and then um, kind of got back into each other's lives, I guess, and then uh, the bombshell came along when he was like, yeah, I'm thinking of doing this, uh, do you want to come come with me? And I was like, well, 
yeah, of course, why not? You know, um, it's always nice to be asked and uh, appreciated. I appreciate what um, Darren is is looking to do as well. Um, probably in the twilight stages, of, shall we say, of his career. There's probably a few more left if he wants it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, he's a great talent. You know, I always, um, which is why we train together so much um, in the early years, pushing each other, doing mental things to kind of break the other person and <laughs> keep driving each other forward and trying to make each other better without kind of having a, a, a jealous effect uh, on that, which I think worked really well. Um, so if I can help him in any way to try and be successful in this tournament, if I can assist him in any way, then yeah, why would you not want to do that? Because um, ultimately someone has done it for me in the past, Hanshi, for example, Felix, other fuse uh, people are there. So um, I think um, if you're able to give back, then for sure, and um, it'll be a it'll be a giggle anyway, e either way, because we always have a laugh and a giggle, and hopefully we get a trophy as well. So good luck to Darren. I hope he does well. <laughs> I hope I, I hope we do well, <laughs> so to speak. But um, yeah, it should be good. My last question has to be this, I don't want to end on a sombre note, but I know the relationship firsthand. But can you just explain what the late great Hanji Steve Arnold meant to you? Um, yeah, Hanji meant a lot um, to me. Um, kind of like a father figure, I guess. And I know lots of people had great relationships with him and I don't profess to be the only one to have had that relationship with him. But um, I looked up to him immensely um, from a very, very early age. I knew that this was kind of the path for me. I wanted to do Kyokushin Karate because of him. I wanted to kind of be like him. I wanted to be able to kind of inspire people and kind of lead the way, I guess, that he kind of did, um, although no one can. But um, as a result, he's very, very important in my life um, and, you know, in, 2021 we lost kind of a, a, a great man not not just in in the karate world but a great man you know he did many many things for many many a people that would not be in the positions that they are today you know i know i wouldn't have been able to achieve what i achieved today without him i think probably hundreds thousands is probably impossible to put a number on the lives that he's touched um is unbelievable, um, and that's just one man. Well, I'm enjoying it tremendously. Okay, okay. It's all bringing back fantastic memories to me. Awesome. What we used to do without the Zoom, when I think at the dojo of Sose Oyama, the first one, you know, it's, it's so similar. You know, I'm very, very proud of both of you. Thank you very, very much, and I think everybody with any IFK who are watching, they should really be privileged to have the two of you doing such a marvelous job. And, you know, if Sosa was alive, I'll tell you what, he would just be over the moon. Thank you. Awesome. Oh. No, thank, really, you. Thank, thank you so much, Angie. <laughs> just, just one man uh, doing all of those things, um, unselfishly giving back, doing what he loves. And I think that's a very, very important thing to why he was so successful, because he loved karate, because he loved doing them things. And um, he, he just had a passion that every time he walks into the dojo, it kind of, if he had had a rubbish day, you kind of didn't know about it because he just enjoyed being in the dojo. And I think um, the relationship that we had, I was very fortunate, as I said, to, to have trained with him from, from day one. You know, I, I didn't know anything else other than Hanchi from day one to the, to the, to the, to the day he died on, in, in July last year. Um, and then after that, you know, the world kind of stands still a little bit and probably still is standing still for me a little bit um, as a result. But it's those kind of relationships that kind of you create in the past that maybe determine you for the future and they kind of live with you forever. You know, I was very fortunate. I'd, I'd, I'd go to the lessons early. I'd um, kind of 
trained with him privately for a little bit before maybe the juniors were there and then I'd do some stretching and, and some other work and then and then I'd train in the seniors with him afterwards. But yeah, I was incredibly lucky, incredibly blessed to have had those opportunities and, and the relationship that I I was fortunate enough to have with him. I miss him on a daily basis. It's never gonna change. Um, and maybe, maybe one day we see each other again, but I won't know that for a few years, hopefully. Multiple world champion in Qatar. You're a multiple world champion or multiple champion in knockdown. You're not too bad at non-contact either. Could you give someone who doesn't know Kukushin, never seen Kukushin, has nothing, no experience, why start? Why come to our organisation? Uh, why start? Because I think everybody wants to be better than they were the day before. And I think karate is the epitome of that. Absolute epitome of it. It doesn't matter whether you take a small progress today and a big progress tomorrow. The ideology and the, 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 the process is that you should aim to be better than you were yesterday. And I think everybody wakes up with that, that attitude. I think karate will help with that. Darren Stringer, I thank you for your time. Thank you. I thank you for your service to the organisation and the inspiration you've given to me. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure.